Paris Perspective. This week, France marks the 200th anniversary of the death of Napoleon Bonaparte after five years in exile on the South Atlantic island of St. Helena. Now, France's fallen emperor was more than willing to embrace comparisons with Julius Caesar, having been an avid reader of the Roman chronicles of Plutarch and openly commenting that as a Corsican, he came from a race that founds empires. Now, today in Paris Perspective, we're going to take a look at the foundations of that empire, the foundations of Lutetia, the island town of the Gallic Sinone and Parisi tribes that fell to the Roman legions commanded by Caesar's most able lieutenant, Labienus, in 52 BC. Now, I'm joined at our starting point today uh, in the heart of Paris's left bank at the uh, Fontaine Saint-Michel by certified guide and conferencier Chris Spence. Chris, great to have you here Thank today. Thank you very much. Well, we're going to be taking a look back at two millennia of history to the foundations of the Gallo-Roman city uh, that was to become Paris. Uh, so let's get a quick rundown of where we're going to go and what we're going to see. Well, first of all, we're going to take a stroll up the Boulevard Saint-Michel, mm -hmm. which is an old Roman cardo. We're going to see where the Forum used to be. And then we're going to swing onto the Cardo Maximus, the main artery mm -hmm. um, around which the Gallo-Roman town of Lutes would have been planned. Mm -hmm. After that, we've got the Roman baths to visit. And then we're going to go to the Ile de la City, mm -hmm. and we're going to see the traces of a Gallo-Roman wall, which tells, which speaks volumes about the imperial crisis uh, that basically shook the empire in the third century. Well, let's get on the road. Perfect. Now, here we are at the Rue Saint-Jacques, which was the uh, site of the original Cardo Maximus, uh, the main street that would have come from what is the edge of the Roman Forum here. And to our right, we have uh, the Pantheon, uh, one of the iconic sites here of Paris. Uh, so, Chris, First and foremost, tell us about the importance of the Cardo Maximus when it came to Rome, let's just say, imposing its uh, power on the vanquished. Whenever possible, the Romans, they constructed their towns uh, in a quadrilateral pattern, mm -hmm. quartering their town for administrative and for tax reasons. Mm. And the Cardo Maximus is, it means literally main artery, mm -hmm. and it was the hub around which they planned the Gallo-Roman town. Mm -hmm. And this point that we're at is very important because you can see we're on a commanding height yes. and we've got this gentle plunging view down to the River Seine. So this is where the Roman surveyors would have stood with their famous instrument, the Groma, mm -hmm. uh, which would have allowed them to create this wonderful straight line. And one thing that I find rather fascinating is when you look at maps of medieval Paris, mm -hmm. you can see, despite the general lack of uh, town planning in the Middle Ages, yeah. you can still see the, car the Roman Cardo Maximus intact on these maps, mm -hmm. whereas most of the old Roman layout has sort of uh, disappeared. Gotcha. Now this uh, was the point zero, ground zero, point zero, whatever you'd like to call it, of uh, the Gallo-Roman city of uh, Lutetia. Um, but can you explain to us exactly what the strategic importance of Lutetia was to the Romans? Well, to be honest, uh, at the beginning, it would have been not much more than a garrison town mm. and really quite handy mm. for keeping an eye on the naughty Belgian tribes. The Belgi, is it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so this would have been sort of like a nice uh, outpost of the Roman Empire. And um, then over time, uh, Lutes, or Lutetia if you prefer, mm. became very prosperous as a trading town. And tell us about, um, you know, when the Roman Empire dissipated or uh, declined, uh, did the succession of, I don't know, modern routes superpose and obliterate the old ones? I mean, did the medieval system just rip everything apart? Well, this is kind of the traditional view of historians, yeah. is that when we enter into the early Middle Ages, we've got the the growth of feudalism mm. and the fabulous Roman road network that held the empire together disintegrates and disappears. Mm. And so what you have is lots of sort of radial local roads mm. uh, in a sort of a manorial economy. Mm. Uh, this has in fact in recent times be, been proved to be false. The problem with knowing about road networks of course is that ancient roads tend to disappear yeah. because you've got other roads being superposed on the top, basically effacing all trace. But in recent studies, ingenious studies, 
they've discovered, in fact, that the Roman road network was and is today still very much in use. And okay, so we've just uh, crossed the road um, from where we were there on the Rue Saint-Jacques, which is the Cardo Maximus of uh, the Gallo-Roman town of Lutetia. Uh, but Chris, you had something to add about this, that this wasn't uh, initially a Roman-only construct. In fact, yes, this is superposed over a very, very ancient, but perhaps proto-historic mm. road, because what we're looking at here is so important. This is the best crossing point over the River Seine for many miles around. So since perhaps the Mesolithic and before, yeah. this has been the best way to basically travel north because with a very shallow hop, you're on the Ile de la Cité and another little hop, you're on the right bank, you can continue your northward journey. Mm -hmm. So this is an example of a road which has layers of history. So even pre-Gaulish uh, had strategic oh, importance. Yes. You can see that a ballista could fire pretty much straight down anything into Absolutely. the Ile de la Cité from here. Yeah. Okay. And of course, if I can just say also, I mean, this kind of type of road in Paris is not unusual because we've got boulevards, haven't we? Sure. And let's not forget it was the, uh, the, the nephew of Napoleon I, Napoleon Le III. Petit Napoleon, as <laughs> yeah. they called him, who in fact revived a little grid of Gallo-Roman Paris on the left bank yeah. by recutting the Boulevard Saint-Michel and the Boulevard Saint-Germain. Because in the Middle Ages, of course, with this kind of chaotic lack of urban planning, mm. um, Paris was like an organic rabbit warren uh, of a town and so uh, he basically recut the Roman roads and so here we have this kind of like nice link with the Napoleonic clan when it comes to town planning in a sense. Okay so now Chris we're at the Rue Montaigne Saint Genevieve. This is the Saint Genevieve uh, church here that is just to the back of the Pantheon. Now this to me looks like very much a, a medieval part of the city that has survived um, the ravages of Haussmann and the, uh, the reforming of the city under Napoleon III and his successors. But um, tell us about the importance of this when it came to the city of Lutetia, because where we're standing now was actually a quarry. Absolutely. And remember that these uh, Romans, they could exploit stone from an exposed cliff face where we're standing. It's kind of like melted over the centuries, mm -hmm. but imagine you would have had exposed stone here. And of course, the stone of Paris, the signature building stone, is this beautiful limestone. Mm -hmm. And you can still see scarring from the Roman exploitation in some of the bizarre, rather, rather eccentric, eccentric rather eccentric contours uh, on the street patterns here. Uh, you can also see, in fact, a lot more clearly, if you go to the Jardin des Plantes, you can actually see in the Alpine Garden, you've got this great big hollow, which is in fact an old Roman stone quarry, and they've even, even got some of the limestone blocks, which are used basically to support the uh, Alpine plants. So, you know, Lutece was very, very rich in natural resources, one of the reasons why it exists. You've got this fine quality building stone, you've got clays from the River Seine, which they would have made into roof tiles in Roman times in the Tuileries Gardens. Uh -huh. And of course, if you break down the word Tuileries, you arrive at the word Tuile, which means a roof tile. Uh -huh. So that's not bad, is it? You've also got the River Seine, water supply. But let's not forget that you had a river that used to run uh, through this area, not very far, over in that direction, right... OK, and as we uh, had a look at the uh, Eglise Saint Genevieve there, um, you brought up that the limestone of Paris that is uh, very particular to uh, the city um, was to hand here. So anybody who was coming through Letitia basically had the best construction materials they needed to construct an empire if they wanted to right at their doorstep. Absolutely. And to crown it all, you also had the vast forests in places like the Somme mm. and river transport to get the timber um, to where you needed it and uh, gypsum from Montmartre and gypsum used to make plaster and uh, Montmartre plaster of the highest quality, uh, plaster of Paris, uh, an international reputation, exportable. So everything you need. And Chris, there was something that you uh, were eager to mention as well, and this is about the garrison and the vestiges of the garrison here in Lutetia. So what exactly uh, is that? 
Well, imagine we've got the conquest of Gaul, mm -hmm. where it's absorbed into the Roman Empire in 52 BC, but we've still got a pretty fragile situation and hostiles. And they've discovered traces of a garrison camp on the commanding heights of the hill here. And in 2007, they came across a V-shaped ditch. That is military, because V-shaped ditches tend to break your ankles. And they've dated it to 30 BC, and they know that it's Roman, because in that ditch they found oysters and mussel shells. And in fact, the Gauls, they didn't eat oysters and mussels. Absolutely unthinkable today, of course, of course, for the French not to eat oysters, but that was the case then. So the Romans brought their mollusk culinary peccadilloes with them. Absolutely. And this is interesting, isn't it? Because you can imagine that military garrison on the hill here uh, would have been uh, fairly improvised, let's say, and would have been uh, made of ditches, mounds and timber. And then we have the consolidation of Lutetia, which would have happened after 30 BC, we have, if you like, the slow transformation of Lutetia into solid built stone with its beautiful monuments, arenas, Roman baths, the whole Bataclan. Okay, well, we've been looking at the, uh, well, the construction materials that have been the foundation of Paris and anybody coming through town has basically had uh, uh, all the resources they needed at their door doorstep. Um, but going from the Gallo-Roman city of Lutetia, or Lutes, as they say in France, uh, we're going to jump forward a thousand years to the period of Philippe Auguste. And this is one of the remaining parts of the old walls of Paris. Absolutely. And in fact, it's the best preserved defensive system of all the defensive systems of Paris. Mm. And let's not forget that Paris has had defensive systems like the rings of an onion over the centuries as it's expanded. And we're going to see, obviously, a bit later on, uh, we're going to see later on uh, the oldest defensive system from the third century mm -hmm. AD. But the Philip Auguste Wall, where you're standing there, you are inside Paris, year 1215. And where I am here, I am outside. And the King Philip Auguste, who loved Paris uh, to the point that when he left for Crusades, he decided to build this formidable wall to protect the city from us English. The likes and of you. <laughs> the likes of us, absolutely. And um, what's, I think, interesting here, first of all, the stone is, again, this signature stone of Paris. You've got this uh, limestone. And I've just noticed here, with a, hopefully without destroying the wall, you can see there that that is crumbly. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> it's interesting to note that the limestone of Paris, you've got all types of limestone suitable for all jobs. And you've got limestone that is, in fact, quite crumbly. But you've got other li limestone, which is perfect for building supports, columns and the like. And the famous architect Viollet le Duc, who restored Notre Dame Cathedral in the 19th century, he was in praise of Paris limestone. And he talked about it when it was quarried, you would basically pull out your block and it would be gorged with water. And what you did is you would leave it to cure in the open and the water would migrate from the inside of the stone block to the outside, but on its journey, it would pick up calcite. And when the water evaporated, when it reached the surface, what you had left was like uh, a calcite envelope sealing the limestone block and making it really very, very um, um, impervious to the effects of pollution and acid rain. So you've got over 20 different types of limestone on the facade of Notre Dame Cathedral. And it shows that they selected limestone for statuary, limestone for supports, columns, and everything in between. And um, here you can see where the limestone comes from geologically because it's riddled with the internal moulds of fossil shells. These spiral shells used to swim around in tropical seas in the Paris basin in a period known as the Lutetian about 40, uh, more than 40 million years ago. And the building style is Roman. So yeah. we're in the time of Philip August. The building style is Roman, where you've got an infill of rubble held together by uh, a, um, cement, and then you've got dressed stone on the outside. Okay, Chris, here we are at the Roman baths in the center of Paris's Latin Quarter, hence the expression the Latin Quarter, because this is really the last 
uh, remaining above ground vestige of uh, the Roman presence in Paris. Uh, but one question comes to mind is when uh, the Battle of Lutetia took place in 52 BC, between the conquering of the Parisi tribe and then the reaching of the apogee of Roman civilization, which of course is the bathhouses, how long did it take for a Gaulish town to become Romanized? Difficult to put a precise date on it, mm -hmm. but we can say that these Roman baths were in use between the first century and the third century AD. So we've got this transition period, haven't we? We've got 52 BC for the Battle of Elysia and the conquest of Gaul. Then we're in the 30s BC for our sort of um, temporary garrison on the top of the hill. And now we're jumping into the first century. Uh, but of course, this is sort of like a, an expression of the great sort of civilization uh, that, um, and the luxuries that the Roman Empire could bring. Okay, now we are looking at one of the last vestiges of uh, Roman Paris that is above ground. But tell us what's so special about what we're seeing here in the city centre. We're, we're basically on one side of the Frigidarium, so mm -hmm. the cold baths of the Roman bath complex. And what makes this structure rather remarkable is we still have the in original internal elevation. Uh, the roof isn't original, but we still have the internal elevation at 14 metres. And uh, that makes it rather special uh, as a structure. We can date it quite n nicely as well by the combination of building materials where you've got these uh, stone blocks here interrupted by lines of tiles. And this, typical, this is quite typical of Roman building styles around the first century AD and beyond. So it's totally in keeping architecturally and stylistically. And also it's north facing, which it's, was uh, the clever thing about keeping, a, well, keeping the Frigidarium frigid. Yes, <laughs> and so many clever ideas about mm. the construction of the Frigidarium, as you say, uh, north facing, and there's only one window that's very high up that takes in any reasonable amount of daylight to keep the temperature down in the Frigidarium. Mm -hmm. You've got a 14 meter elevation, so all of the hot air basically mm -hmm. rises and then escapes through the windows. Mm -hmm. uh, also, something very ingenious is the um, incline, because to evacuate the waters, what we have is a gravity flow going that way, leading down to the River Seine. And of course, the Frigidarium, as the name suggests, is where you would have a, a cold dip mm -hmm. at the end of your seance in the baths, uh, your session, rather, in the baths. And um, to cool the water, um, basically, it was isolated from the hypercoast system. So you had walls isolating it from the primitive Roman central heating. Sure. Uh, and also, uh, the inlet pipes with the water uh, would have, in fact, um, gushed water across mosaic tiling and it wouldn't be through any kind of like um, conduit yeah. it would actually be on the surface of the mosaics oh. so imagine a film of water that's basically coming into the frigidarium you've got like a a double cooling effect by going over the cool mosaic yeah. tiling. So Images of an infinity pool almost. You know, oh, exactly. Imagine, yeah. absolutely yeah. beautiful. And of course, mosaics, you can really appreciate them only when you tip a little bit of water on. That's when the colours become incredibly uh, vivid. And um, uh, we know that there were mosaic uh, tiles there because of the form of cement that they used, which you can still see today in the interior. You've got the Roman cement, which is uh, opus uh, cementitium, uh, which is, they have different categories of cement, different formulas for different functions. So if you can see opus cementitium, you know pretty much that there was either marble slabs or mosaic that lay on the top. The mosaics don't survive, but we've still got some Roman cement, which has come down to us. I think that's marvelous. We have seen that the Romans were pretty flexible in incorporating the gods of the people that they uh, vanquished. Um, but there was something that uh, was found in the site of Notre Dame Cathedral that is particularly special. Tell us about that. It's very special in two senses. First of all, we've got the oldest um, grouping of figures in statuary in Gaul. And also, it shows Roman gods side by side with Celtic gods in this rather happy cohabitation 
So on this pillar, which would have stood about five metres tall, probably crowned with a statue dedicated to Tiberius Caesar, so we can date it from AD 14 onwards, and it's a tribute to Tiberius from the uh, boatmen of the River Seine, a, a corporation known as the Parisii, who basically controlled the river traffic. Mm -hmm. And they were basically sort of like uh, uh, greasing up to Tiberius Caesar because uh, it was financially advantageous for them to so control the river traffic. It was traffic. like a Gallo-Roman guild, basically. Is Absolutely, it? and it shows, you know, not all the conquered peoples, they were necessarily sort of like rebelling against their masters. So with this statue of the, boat, of the boatmen, what exactly do we see? What representations do we see? Well, we've got this marvellous cohabitation of Celtic gods, Isis, Cernunus, side by side with Roman gods, so Vulcanus, the blacksmith of the gods, and Fortuna, for example. So it really is indicative of the Roman tolerance towards other religions, apart from Christianity. And of course, um, Christianity was the exception because the Christians, they were a bit sort of like uh, aloof, mm -hmm. and they didn't welcome other gods. So that really set them apart, as well as being slightly troublesome and a little bit aggressive in propagating their religion. So good reasons to persecute a Christian, I think you'll agree. Okay, now Chris, here we are on the Ile de la Cité and we're on Rue Colombe. And what is interesting about, uh, well, our situation where we are right now is that we've got, is it one of the only, if not the only trace of the Gallo-Roman wall that is left that demarcates the boundaries of Lutetia? Yes or rather we've got the only visible trace of the wall above ground mm. and you can go into the archaeological crypt in front of Notre Dame Cathedral and you can get up nice and close gotcha. and you can see the remains of a Gallo-Roman wall that was constructed around the Ile de la Cité when the Roman Empire was going through uh, a crisis known as the Imperial Crisis. So this speaks volumes about what's happening yeah. uh, in Rome. Yes. And if you go and visit the um, archaeological crypt and inspect some of the stones carefully, you can see that some of the stones have recycled from the old Roman arenas because you've got the name of the prominent citizen engraved yes. who had his own reserved seat at the, you know, uh, at the arenas and you can still see those names. So it shows that they, what they did in a bit of a hurry is that they recycled um, elements, architectural elements, from the left bank, which of course was the heart of Gallo-Roman Lutetia, and they basically made a wall in a big hurry. That would have been seven metres high, um, and it would have been about two and a half, three metres thick. So the luxury of the arenas and potentially even the baths were now put to the side because they were these are, we're talking about the Germanic tribes that are coming? Absolutely. You've got the Goths, the Visigoths, the Alemanni that are crossing the Rhine because of this fragilization in the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire is fragilized because of the uh, murder of um, a Roman emperor, em emperor uh, in 235, uh, Septimus Alexander and it throws succession into chaos and what you have is competing Roman generals all with their own armies looking to uh, become emperor mm -hmm. and uh, it throws the Roman Empire into turmoil. You've got this incredible turnover of emperors, no less than 26 emperors in the space of 50 years. And they're all trying to promote their own personal ambitions using their own personal loyal armies as clout mm. to achieve that. And of course they neglect the very important task of defending the Roman Empire. So now we've got porosity and the advantages of Lutetia uh, for trade uh, were its communications, sure. river systems, road networks. This now serves as a weakness because those Germanic tribes, they can see Lutetia as accessible. It's wealthy by the third century, very important trading town, and it's vulnerable. So what we have is a wall constructed and the population would have retrenched here on the island for safety. We don't know what the population was, but we could say between six, 10,000 people would have been on the island. And of course, back in the third century AD, just over there, this would have been water. 
Mm -hmm. And we can see today that the embankment is about 30 odd meters over in that direction. Mm -hmm. But the island has expanded over the centuries because the Parisians have land grabbed. Mm -hmm. And if you're building a defensive wall around an island, you don't build it in the middle of the island so that the enemy can sort of like land and have a nice little <laughs> picnic before sure. they attack you. You build it on the edge to make life a little bit difficult. So we can imagine that was the water's edge back in the third century AD. Well, Chris, we're coming to the end of our edition of Paris Perspective uh, in the great outdoors today. And thankfully, the uh, weather has been kind. The gods have been in our favor that we didn't get completely drenched. Um, but we're finishing now on the banks of the Seine. Um, and indeed, this week we are marking the 200th anniversary of the death of Napoleon Bonaparte. But what we've looked at today is really the foundations of empire and, uh, well, that we could say that Napoleon stood on the shoulders of his predecessors, especially coming from the, the time of uh, 52 BC when the, uh, the Romans conquered Letizia and the Parisi tribe up through to Philip Auguste. We've now just seen the uh, Gallo-Roman walls and uh, the like, but it, it really one could say that it all started in 52 uh, BC. So just to end our edition here, uh, we're going to look back to that battle. It was a key moment in the conquest of Gaul, the, Gaul, the Gallic Wars that um, Julius Caesar wrote about, that indeed Napoleon would have studied himself. Um, if it weren't for the Romans having won here in Lutetia, it might have been that they wouldn't have turned up at Alessia, which was the final downfall of Vercingetorix and the, ri the rising of the Gallic tribes against Rome's power. So it was a key time. I think that's fair to say. Um, what we have is uh, a confederacy of hairy Gaulish tribes uh, that are causing trouble underneath the leadership of the charismatic Vercingetorix and Julius Caesar gets wind of um, a revolt that is uh, in, centered around this area with the uh, Senon tribe and the Parisii mm -hmm. and in fact they're going to be uh, joined or an attempt joining by the Biberacti mm -hmm. as well. So he detaches Labienus, Le who is one of his trusted generals, with three legions to come up and confront, sort out this problem. And uh, he's up against a, a Gaulish um, chieftain who's old and wily. Yes, he's, and he's, he's, a, he's a grizzled old warrior. Yes. What is it, Camel... Camelogenus. Camelogenus, that's how mm. you pronounce it, okay. Mm. It's one way to pronounce it's one way. it. Fair enough, <laughs> depending on your patois. Camelogenus, Camelogenus. Okay. I'm tempted to say Camelogenus, okay. but Camelogenus. So, uh, in all fairness, uh, it, it could have swung either way, but there was a ruse that uh, Labienus made in coming up the Seine. One well, must remember that... Yeah, he would have approached, in fact, from upstream. Exactly. And this, at the time, one has to um, remark upon that this was all marshland. Absolutely. All of this, yeah. Well, certainly over there, we're the in Marais. the Marais, aren't we? So that would have been marshy. And Camelogenus, he used the marshes to his advantage, and he knew that the Romans would be very reluctant to get caught up in marshes that they didn't know, mm. and they could be picked off quite easily. And um, but Camelogenus was playing sort of like a bit of a time game because remember that the Parisii and the Senon, they were in, engaged, but they, you also had the Bibracti that were coming down to join the fight mm. from the north. Mm. So if they could wait until that um, tribe arrived, then that would be advantageous. Uh, there seems to have been a, a face-off. So imagine you've got Romans on that side of the river, you've got Camelogenus on the other side of the river. He burns the oppidum that would have been on the island, so sort of like a scorched earth policy. policy yeah. um, so there was perhaps um, a, a Celtic oppidum fortified town on this island. Although, to be honest with you, the exact location is a little bit vague mm. and contentious. Labienus is on that side, Camelogenus is on the other side. We've got a burnt oppidum on the island. And what Labienus does is actually rather um, obvious in my book uh, because he creates um, a diversion tactic. 
-hmm. And at night time, he sends four cohorts going upstream, making as much noise as possible so that Camelogenus thinks, ah, the Romans are going that way. So he detaches part of his force. Meanwhile, the bulk of the Roman force, they tiptoe downstream where boats have been floated silently overnight and are waiting to take them over to the right bank. And again, it's not 100% sure where this decisive battle took place, but many historians believe it would have been around where today we have the Eiffel Tower. Uh, what you have is the Romans engaging the Gauls, uh, a flanking movement so the Romans get behind. They basically catch the Gauls in a pocket and there's no escape. But the Gauls don't give up and they all of them fight to the death, including Camelogenus himself. And of course, what you have there is Lebianus and his um, legions who are able to join uh, Julius Caesar, Utterless. as you rightly said. And really, I would say, why not tip the balance? Because yes. Julius Caesar was so hard pressed at one point, it was touch and go. So those extra legions from Lebianus would have certainly uh, helped to The sway. 7th and the 12th legion, apparently, yeah. that, that, that yeah. went to relieve uh, Caesar at Alessia. Chris Spence, um, for joining me today for Paris Perspective in the Great Outdoors and, uh, well, giving us a look at the foundation of empire here at uh, Lutetia, the centre of Paris. Thank you very much for being with me today. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>